Shepard's got style. By God, he don't. He doesn't mess around. And for those of you who are uh, wondering what style is, style, friends, is viewpoint. <laughs> Bring it up there, Larry. Which is something that uh, many people have trouble having. and there's been many writing about it in the past years. There is a set of fantastic lyrics for this theme song. However, you know how it is for censorship. Uh, you'll notice that the show tonight has a certain verb and uh, éclat, uh, joie de vivre. I'd like to tell you that, uh, you know, it's like a doctor who is sitting there in his uh, consultation room and a guy comes in with a terminal case of warts. He doesn't like to have to tell him that, that this wart that he's got in his thumb is going to grow to a gigantic wart and that ultimately uh, he himself will be a wart with feet. He doesn't want to tell him that. And the doctor is never popular for telling a man this. No way. In fact, uh, I, I have a friend who is a doctor, and he, he told me about a friend of his who learned that lesson in the oh, worst, hardest, most mean possible way. His, uh, his specialty, this doctor's specialty, was Edward Dupois, obesity. Did you know there are doctors who specialize in that? Very unpopular doctors because the disease is hated. It is accompanied by self-loathing. It's accompanied by many uh, little uh, drifting, cloudy, uh, psychological, misty, uh, flashing bits of anger that go in all different directions. It is not true that the world loves a fat man. Let's put it this way. The world never casts a fat man in almost anything unless he's playing a clown, a knave, or a private eye. And that's a very special, <laughs> that, that can often be all three once in the same simultaneously. But uh, however, uh, uh, this friend of mine was telling me about his buddy who got out of uh, one of the most eminent medical universities in, in the country. And he studied in Europe and he came back and he set up his practice. And uh, within 10 minutes, his first patient arrived, a lady who couldn't all be jelly because jelly don't shake like that. She came in, and you could hear the beams creaking in the building. And in fact, uh, she she had a guy came with her who had a small portable hand winch, and they uh, they brought her up there. And I'm not laughing at her problem; she just had it. See, so she came in there, and at the same time as she sat down in front of the uh, desk there, he had one of these elegant uh, uh, chromium Eames chairs. You know the kind of Eames chairs. You know the kind of beautiful chairs that. He, he, he went all out, you know, to buy office furniture. Uh, you know, many doctors do this when they first had a practice. They get all excited about getting this IBM multi-dynamic typewriter, and they find out that typing out the bills doesn't get them paid. So uh, ultimately, <laughs> doctor's uh, furniture begins to get more and more shabby as he gets to be a better doctor. Uh, the, the, uh, the young doctor often has, uh, oh, just the most elegant, uh, newest sort of... Uh, a uh, hip, modern, with an E, umlaut, uh, type furniture, usually made in Denmark. Well, he had one of those chairs, which he was very proud of. He had a whole set of them, say, and they were chrome chairs. They were all made out of stainless steel chrome plated with the, with the cordovan leather backs, sling backs, and all that stuff. And she sat in the chair. And he said it was fascinating. Have you ever heard a uh, an eight-wheel locomotive coming to a halt? with all that screaming and squealing of wheels and stuff, he says, all of a sudden, there's this screaming and squealing coming from in front of his desk, and he sees the lady slowly sink out of sight. He said, it was like, it was like the sun going down over the Alpines, over the Alpine passes. He saw the top of her head, and uh, finally they winched her up again, and uh, they, they got her perched on one of his uh, tremendous double-thick steel uh, file cabinets, and she sat there for a while, and uh, he says, I noticed that was beginning to bulge out at the sides. It's a fantastic sight. And uh, 
<laughs> he says, and so she whipped out of her handbag, which had a which had a, a capacity of about seventeen bushels. Uh, she whipped out of her handbag a two pound a uh, two pound box of assorted Barracino goodies, and proceeds to stuff them into her trap steadily as she talked. And she kept telling him he could not understand why she was so fat. Well. Uh, at that point, uh, being a doctor, see, he said, to, well, madam, he said, uh, you'll have to have a complete examination. It is a mystery to me, too, uh, why you're so fat. And all the while, I could hear the chopping of nuggets and the, the, the steady crunch of, uh, of bitter chocolate-covered marshmallows and the clatter of upper plate against peanut cluster was, uh, was going on steadily. <laughs> and so finally, <laughs> after the examination was concluded, a half an hour examination with uh, all kinds of little things you squeeze and bands, he had to send out for a special band, you know, for his, uh, his you know, the thing that they take the blood test uh, or the uh, pressure thing. Well, it didn't go around, see, so uh, they had to send out for a special one. They got this special one from, from Bellevue that they use for rhinos and things that they bring in there occasionally. So they put it around there, see, and he squeezed it up there, and everything works fine. And uh, finally, he says, well, ma'am, you have one basic problem. And uh, in between time, by the way, between various phases of the examination, her man kept running out for blimpies. And uh, he'd come back in with, uh, you know, she she had a very, very definite taste in blimpy. She liked the Italian sausage blimpy with green peppers, with grated Parmesan cheese. That was the one she went for. And uh, she kept offering him uh, blimpies. And, of course, uh, he said, well, uh, uh, I don't like to do this when I work. Thank you very much. And she said, well, I don't want to let it go to waste, so I might as well eat this one, too. So she'd eat his blimpy, too. You know, that's the problem with a lot of fat people. They... They order for two, and then when the guy doesn't want it, they eat it just so it doesn't go to waste. And so, anyway, <laughs> it sure doesn't. She was eating the paper, too, that they came in. He said it was really something to see. So uh, after it was all over, he says, Madam, you have one problem. And uh, she said, what was that? What, please? I'm desperate. He says, well, it's a basic problem. Oh, please, I'm so pleased at last I found someone. And he says, well, you just eat too damn much, you know? That silence. And she, as best she could, she leaped up. He says, it looked like the eruption of a Hawaiian volcano slowly erupted. So she rose heavily from the ground. And she says, I was never so insulted in my life. And at that point, she went down the stairs by aid of the winch. And all the while eating baby Ruth candy bars as she did. And in the end, he realized the one basic truth from that. What is the basic truth? All right, friends, that will be the subject of next week's examination. I want you to use your intelligence in your brain, please. I am now wearing, to, to explain to you why there is a certain uh, uncontrolled joie de vivre to tonight's effort, is that I am delighted to report that a couple of nights ago, on this very same microphone, uh, we reported that uh, I had received a a uh, note from one of the uh, men's apparel research corporations. Curiously enough, they addressed me as Mr. Shepherd, but uh, nevertheless, <laughs> I keep getting that kind of mail, but the, it's the first name confuses everybody, you know. But um, no, well, after all, it's a French name, and you know those French don't know anything about names. But uh, nevertheless, I got this note, and it says, what is your favorite item of apparel? Well, I had a choice. Like most of us, uh, we have choices in our life. Are you going to chicken out and tell them what they want to hear and therefore make you personally a more elegant person? I like to say a suede buskin, my favorite item of apparel, me and George Plimpton. Uh, you know, that kind of elegance, uh, that, that decayed elegance of people who sit and spend their lives next to potted fern plants. Contemplating a bust of Stuart Mott. I, uh, you don't know who Stuart Mott is? Apple juice, a mile wide. So, uh, nevertheless, uh, the, the question came up, you know, my head says, should I tell him the truth? Or should I write something like, uh, my, uh, after six evening smoking jacket? That's a damn fool. Why? So I wrote right down there what I, what I felt. I wrote that. My favorite item of apparel, which had been stolen from my office in a 
terrible, uh, just a terrible ripoff. My fatal item of apparel is the painter's cap. I've always been in love with painter's caps from the time I was a little kid. You know what a painter's cap is? I don't mean the beret, you know, the classical uh, uh, French Impressionist beret. I'm talking about a painter's cap, you know, the kind that says Sherwin-Williams blankets the world or paints the world or something. has a big uh, paintbrush on the front, courtesy of the Acme Hardware Store. And uh, those, uh, those to me, have, have a, a genuine definite style. It's unmistakably a painter's cap. You can't say, well, that's a, that's a polo hat. Uh, you know, that, uh, they wear those at the Shea. No, it's a painter's cap. And, and, uh, and I look particularly good in them, don't I? So I now have my painter's cap on. Uh, as I reported this uh, a couple of nights ago, the Benjamin Moore Company, somebody from the Benjamin Moore crowd heard this, and they sent me two great painter's caps. I can't wear both of them at the same time, uh, not since my operation. But uh, I, I, uh, I now have this painter's cap on. It's beautiful, uh, and it is a bicentennial painter's cap. It, uh, <laughs> it's, uh, you know, there's, there's a little beautiful American eagle on the side, says Benjamin, where it says, seen over all the rotten scars on America, or something like that. And so I, I wear this in the office. I'm getting, uh, I'm getting an, an additional respect. Because after all, the price that painters get these days per hour, you do get respect. And uh, yes, uh, Mr. O'Neill uh, tipped his bowler to me in the... Because I could have called a strike, you know. I could just, uh, you know, just like that. I blow the whistle and all every painter for miles around would be out on strike. You know what that would uh, bring about. But uh, nevertheless, I do have my painter's cap on. It's giving me added self-confidence. And uh, I feel great about it now. And uh, if, if anybody else has got any painter's caps out there that they've got bouncing around like Sherwin-Williams, I'd like a good Sherwin-Williams. I'd like a good, uh, uh, this is a Moorguard uh, hat. I'd like a good uh, DuPont latex. That's a good one. That was a nice one. That was done in the form of a paper mache derby. And uh, <laughs> if you out there <laughs> have any painter's caps, well, you know where to get rid of them, and you can complete Shepard's collection. You know, every day a new painter's cap. One for every day of the week. I'm sitting down there at the chart. I went down there today with my Moor Guard hat. Again, I got respect. It's a rare commodity in today's world, friends. Rare. Hey, uh, speaking of other, uh, uh, you know, bits and pieces that we have to pull together here today, and I do feel that we should pull a few of the bits and pieces together. Yeah, here I have it here. Uh, uh, we did a show here a couple of months ago on, uh, on, uh, on license plates, you know, the slogans on the bottom of license plates, the scenic state, you know, that kind of, but uh, there's some guy says, well, lucky says, Jeff, that's great. You collect these, uh, you know, the license plate insignias, uh, various slogans and stuff. Uh, you know, in the last five or six, maybe 10 years, there's been a, a, a thing, a new thing that's been sweeping the country. It hasn't yet hit New York. And that is you pay an extra five bucks or 10 bucks and you can get letters on your plate that say something, whatever you want. If your name is, uh, you know, if your name is Cletus, uh, you can get Cletus on there. If you're a total ego, you know, total ego nut, you can get your name on the back of your car. Have you seen that all around? Okay. Now, he says he collects them. He says in California especially shows a, an unexpected streak of creativity. He's just come back from California, and these are actual license plates that he has collected. By the way, I might tell you, well, I won't, I won't tip the gap. Here's one. How's this one? Uh, horse 5. Horse 5. He says, imagine calling a horse 5. He says, but horse 5. Here's one. Meow. How about cheers? <laughs> Here's one. Wazoo. W-H-A-Z-O-O. Wazoo. That's not bad. How about rebate? That was on, by the way, a 75 Plymouth Fury. So <laughs> there's a guy who describes what he's got. How about this one? Me sad. Two words. Me sad. Uh, this one, no toy. It's on a VW. It says no toy. Here's one. Honey! Exclamation point at the end. We. How about this one? Try Yuko. U-C-O. I don't know what that one means. How about whiskey? And then, of course, there's one called booze. 
That's a, you know, common one. How about Wigsy? Here's one. Fat. <laughs> S-O-T. <laughs> here's a, here's a, a really good one. Lout. L-O-U-T. Now, for those of you who don't know what the word lout means, look it up. It may describe many of your friends and relatives. Here's one. Hop in. And he said that the lady that was driving this looked like she was in a business that is not necessarily officially accredited, but is quite old and uh, quite popular. Hop in. And this one is, says, I love you. Oh, God. Oh, I love you. Oh, boy. There's a guy that's just looking for a bashed in back end. How about this one? Um, <laughs> see my car. Oh, he's got a C, and then it says my and I, car, see my car. Oh, wow. How about the St. Mark? Oh, a little uh, religion there comes in. Brat 3. Brat 3. Gay 1. That's kind of a good one. That says it right there. How about, um, hi, Ike. <laughs> I just go, hi, Ike. Here's one. <laughs> Tell all. That's kind of good. Tell all. Here's one. Uh, I think this one is kind of nice. It's a very really fit here in New York. Flep. It, it comes right out. The flep. Mrs. G. Mysterious lady wearing a black mask. She had black flowers on the car. You know, this very elegant lady. Margot Rogers. is in thousands of just plain ordinary names. Well, I saw one. You won't believe this. I saw one that was a uh, Massachusetts plate. No later than... Three weeks ago, that was simply the the word in just one word. It says W O P. <laughs> now I saw that the guy goes by. I say, I just, well, how did he get away with that? You know, and, and there he goes driving on the street, and he's he's on on Route 128 outside of Boston, and uh, you know, guys kept looking at his car, and honking, getting mad, you know, catching up. Well, when they saw though that that uh, obviously he had big flowing mustache, you know, and he he. Uh, he was covered with pasta. that was okay. See? <laughs> but there it was. I, I don't make the news, friends. I only report it. But the one of the greatest, one of the greatest uh, coups that I ever heard of came about when I, I was living for a while in Cincinnati. And Cincinnati, the uh, the license plates are made by the state pen out there. And uh, you know they have a factory up in Columbus or someplace where they work. All these guys in maximum security are making license plates all day long. And, you know, that must be a really frustrating job to be to be in, in for light or something. And you're making license plates which are devoted. You know, what is a license plate used for? It's a, it's a passport that endless travel and freedom. And, you know, it's really ironical. So these guys are making these license plates. And, and uh, I had a car out there. And when you get the plate, you didn't request any numbers or anything. They just came to you. And they used to have combinations of letters and numbers. Almost like the way New York has now, like, you know, X, D, Y, 1, 2, 3, something like that. And uh, once in a while, you'd see some really elegant man from uh, the state capitol who knew, you know, the real, uh, the real people in the license bureau. He'd have just letters, like his license uh, it would say his uh, initial, like uh, JPS or LDQ. And those were really high upshot, you know, really top guys. So <laughs> one day... Out of the blue, this guy living in Dayton, just an ordinary walking around citizen, he uh, gets his license plate in the mail. He opens it up, and he cannot believe what his license plate is. It is a simple, ancient, Anglo-Saxon four-letter word that relates to uh, uh, physical activity uh, remotely uh, related to procreation. And that was, and it was, and, and, and it came in that, that year, the, the license plate was particularly colorful. It was a bright yellow background and, and burning black letters. You, you, you know, you could see it for 30 miles and it was a big plate and he gets this license plate. He says, wow, you know, holy smokes. At that point, he rushes out and uh, he, he takes his old plates off of his Studebaker you know, conventional number, and he clamps his new plates <laughs> with pride. <laughs> you know, this was beyond all the dreams of any license plate holder that he could get something like this. And at that point, he drives out of his driveway and starts to roll down his street. 
And uh, he, he goes about a half a block, and there's a school down the street. And there's uh, thousands of kids are getting out of school, and they see his lights. He says, hey, children, let him play. Oh, 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 oh. And by, but, you know, by the time he's in the middle of the third block down the street, there's a crowd. But guys are running out, getting in their cars, and they're taking pictures at the back of his car. And, and by the time he reached six blocks down a main intersection, five squad cars converged on him. He was... He, he was given tickets for everything from, from public obscenity <laughs> to indecent exposure. God, and they were laying tickets on him. He kept saying, well, here, here's my registration. Look, I got it from the state. Let it come from Columbus. Just get in the car. Get in the back there. Smart guy. And the poor guy, he paid. He actually had to pay. Did you know what they got him on? No, he had to pay. He had to pay fines for public indecent offenses. You should have known. When you got that license plate, that it was a mistake. So what do you mean a mistake? The state make a mistake? Are you kidding? Oh, it's only people that make mistakes, not the state. Forget it, buddy. And and they tried to they they tried to investigate to discover what convict had turned that out, <laughs> wrapped it up, sent it off, and, and they never found out. So there is today, right now, an unsung hero. Uh, somewhere he, he's probably still in the slam. Any guy that would uh, would put that on a license plate, he's he's got nothing to lose, <laughs> everything to gain. <laughs> so so that, that that is a true actual. So of course, since that time now, they have tight, strict controls on that kind of stuff. That's why I wonder how that Massachusetts plate got through. I can think of some really interesting in words uh, that. Uh, that you know that that the, the general public doesn't know the real meaning of. You agree? You know a few of those, huh? Everybody does. But uh, you know, <laughs> speaking of license plates, I think that the funniest thing that ever happened to me one time with license plates. I still to this day don't know how it happened. Uh, I was parked in a parking lot in Maine. This is some time ago. This is about eight or nine years ago. I parked in a parking lot in Maine. I had New York plates on my car. You know, I live in New York, so I had New York plates. I came back out of this. This was a huge supermarket complex. They had the uh, hardware stores and their uh, discount stores and the whole bit there, you know. And, and about an hour or maybe two hours after I parked, there must have been 12,000 cars in this parking lot. I came out of the, came out of the store there. And I'm looking for my car. I walk up and down the line. And I, I see these, you know, all the cars. And I know where the car was, but I can't find my car. I can't figure it out. And so I go back in the store, and I come back out again. I said, now I'm going to start all over again. Now, I know that I turned slightly left. Now, I'm going to try it again. So I walked down that long line of cars. And there was a car there. In fact, there were several cars. The car that I happened to have at the time was a, was a car of which there were many around, it was a little unusual, but there were many of them around. It seems like a contradiction, but it can be true. You know, there are many Jaguars, yet the Jaguar is an unusual car. So I can't believe it. And I looked in this car, and sure enough, inside the car was a pipe. I have a pipe. I, 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 my pipe was in there. And I go back out, and I look around. There are main license plates on this car now. I go back out again, I look and go, and then I got my key, see? So I take, I put the key in the thing, I says, this can't be. So I put the key in the, in the door, sure enough, the door opens up, I get in and it's my car, there's all my stuff, like, you know, bottle caps in the back seat, and the, you know, the, yes, it's my car, absolutely my car. I open up the, the glove compartment and there's my junk in there. I, oh, I, my glove compartment is like Fibber McGee's closet. Uh, you don't dare open it because the stuff just leaps. Uh, you get hit by wrenches and uh, and uh, air pressure gauges and uh, decks of cards and footballs and books of matches and junk. That's my car. What the hell? So at that point, I get back out of the car and I walk around again, and there it is. Two absolutely matching, very official-looking main license plates. To this day, I don't know what happened. <laughs> I, I went. I went to the. I didn't know what to do. See, so at that point, I says, "Well, I'm not going to. 
you know, I, I knew what would happen if if I went down to the local slammer and told them about that. They'd confiscate the car and they'd put on an APB and the whole bit, see. So I just drove around with the main license plates. I don't know what it was. It could have been an axe murder, you know. <laughs> but I drove around for about two weeks with the main license plates. And finally, uh, when it was all all said and done, I, I drove back to New York with the main license plates. And finally, I got to the garage and where I keep the car, see, and I drove in. And this guy says, all right. He says, hey, pull it over there. I'll give you a check. He says, it's me. It's me. Don't you remember me? He says, uh, yeah, what would you do? Get a new car? He says, no, this is my car. He says, what the hell's with the, with the main plates? I says, I've got my reasons. And, you know, I like to have a little mystery in my life. He says, oh, oh, okay. No questions asked. No questions answered, right? I said, that's right, Luigi. And so at that point, oh, yeah. Now, by the way, there's a myth around the garage that uh, that this guy with this sinister-looking car in the corner there, you know, that foreign car is up to no good, you know, that he's got a button that he presses on his... He's got a button that he presses on the uh, dashboard and the plates change, throws tacks out the back. <laughs> I've always wanted to have a car that did that. You know, you press a button, it throws four pounds of carpet tacks behind you. But that'd be a great uh, accessory, by the way. So, uh, and and I all I did then was, was uh, call up the... Uh, Call up the license bureau. See, and I said to the license bureau, I says, I, I, I have a very difficult problem. I know how to explain it to you. And they, uh, I says, uh, somebody took my plates off my car and put some main plates on. And they said, Oh, really? Are they are they valid main plates? And I said, Yes. And uh, so uh, they says, What's the number on them? I says, Well, uh, here. And I gave them the number. See, and they said, Oh, fine. Well, you just send them in. Send them in, and be sure to send a note with it. And we'll send you back a duplicate set of plates. Five dollars, please. So at that point, I said, I never knew. I never learned what happened, you know? So, so the license plate is, a, uh, is, is today, with many people, uh, one of the last avenues of artistic expression. And uh, the license plate, uh, you know, has, has a certain uh, uh, mystique about it. Uh, what, what license plate, for example, has a... Uh, all right, here's one. What license plate is made in the shape of the state? that it represents. Hey, listen, speaking of licenses, I know one guy that uh, has collected all his uh, driver's licenses from the time he was 16, got his first learner's permit, and he has them all. He's about 108 now, and uh, he carries them all with him. And when any time somebody comes up and says, uh, you know, a guy looks in the window, this uh, this guy with the big hat looks and says, all right, come on, buddy, let me see your license. Give me your driver's license. He reaches into his glove compartment and takes out this great big package and says, which one? And he hands him out there. And the guy says, I want the 1975 license, smart guy, not the 1916 license. But uh, he's got a great collection. We're going to skip that one. Don't, don't get confused, gentlemen. So uh, he, uh, <laughs> I know another guy, by the way, that has collected, oh, there's all kinds of great collections. You know, I know a guy that collects uh, bus transfers from all over the country. You know, bus transfers. You know, those little green piece of paper they used to give out in the buses? He collects his bus transfers and, and, and tokens of various types. Of course, with the way uh, New York City tokens are going, they will be worth endless amounts of money eventually. I mean, one ride on a subway could go for $30, $40. And, uh, you know, he would have them made into keychains and stuff. Would you please bring it up there, Andy? You notice, joie de vivre, Elan, pizzazz, and it all came about because of my great new Moorgard hat, a terrific hat, and uh, yes, it's got a flexible bill on the front there, and uh, I think I'll go out and do a little freelance barn painting, and a little barn painting there, Let's bring it up there, please. This license plate, Wigsy. Oh, that's, that's a little cute. You know. No, no, no. Oh, oh, by the way, I, I saved the last one for last. There's a guy that has a plate in California that says, I hate you. <laughs> the U, of course, is a letter. driver on the San Diego freeway. You know California, buddy. You 
got no friends.